Hello and welcome to M&A Murders and Accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. We dig into what you need to know and how not to kill the sell of your business. Now here's our host, Rick J. Krebs, Mergers and Acquisitions Advisor. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Rick Krebs, the M&A Cowboy, coming to you from the beautiful mountains of Utah. And today we're going to talk about, I think, in a very important topic, if you're thinking about selling a business, and that is, what questions do you ask and how do you approach a buyer as you're asking these questions? So this goes along with three or four other podcasts that we've done about buyer meetings and what to do. I find oftentimes that sellers have never sold a business before, right? And you're finding yourself in a place which was the largest single financial transaction of your life, never been there before, don't know what to do. And a good M&A advisor will help coach you through this, but this is good information I want to get out. So as you approach the notion of asking buyers questions and as you're having meetings with them, I want to use an analogy here. Picture this, you're Cinderella at the ball trying to find a handsome prince and you're going around through the evening and you're You're dancing with one and then dancing with another one. And you don't want to fall in love too soon because there's a lot of princes out there, but you want to dance with everyone at the ball, right? And so you're in complete control and uh, you're going to want to dance and flirt with them and have fun with them, but don't fall in love with one too soon and don't spend the whole ball dancing with just one potential handsome prince. Spend some time with multiple people and ask multiple questions. As you approach these handsome princes and these potential buyers, you're going to want to ask probing, thoughtful questions. And it's okay to have a list. In fact, I think the buyers like that you have a list and you've put a lot of thought into it. And it's okay to tell them that this business is your baby And uh, you want to make sure that it goes to the right partner. And I would use the word partner. They like that. This is a marriage. It's not a divorce. It's not one where you just close the transaction, you throw the keys on the counter and say good luck to the buyers. (laughs) It's just not how it works with selling businesses. So probing thoughtful questions, talk to a lot of different buyers. As you know, you may only have one or two You may only have one, but you never want to let them think that they're the only game in town. You never want them to think that they're the only suitor, the only handsome prince. Even if you have to dance with the janitor, you're going to dance with others and let them see that you're dancing with others. One of the tactics which we use as we're we're bringing buyers in is I like to set up meetings back to back with multiple buyers. And I like to see them walk down the hall and look at each other in the eye and scour a little bit, you know, and scowl at them. So they hate it, but we love it because we want them to know that you're not just going to pick one and run with them. You're not just going to pick somebody and just run with that person. You're going to put some thought into this, that they are not the only suitor. They're they're not the only buyer. And this pushes the price up. And I love to see that. So as you're thinking about these probing, thoughtful questions, you're going to want to shift away from the price discussion, away from the selling price narrative, and move towards an understanding perspective. For instance, if they have thrown out a number, before you respond back, you're going to want to put them on their heels a little bit and say, you know what, before we answer this question and answer you back about our response to your offer, We want to know where you came from. How did you calculate this number? Or were there comparables which you used? Where did this number come from? We know it wasn't just kind of taken out of the sky, but how did you arrive at this number that you're offering or at this proposal? Help us understand your process. And you see, you shift away from the price and the numbers narrative to an understanding narrative, understanding where they're coming from. And I find that by understanding where people come from, It helps you better know how to respond to them. So you're going to want to buy time and date as much as you can. So the buyers are pushing the gas pedal and we're pushing the brake. It's a bit of a dance. It's a bit of a game that we play with them. But why are you pushing the brake? Because you want to spend a little bit of time with some of the other buyers and work with them and see where they're at. And the buyers are going to sometimes get aggressive. They're going to want to come in, get an offer made. 
get you off the market, right? They want a ring on the finger. They want to get you off the market so everyone can see that ring on the finger and they know that you're no longer available. We buy time, date as much as we can. We date a little more, date all you can, and then you make a decision and then you get engaged. And once you're engaged, you are committed to that person. Once you've got a letter of intent, you're committed to that buyer and less things pop up or less that you can't settle on some key points or unless you see things that uh, as you're looking under the hood, so to speak, instead of kicking the tires, you're looking under the hood. And if you see something that's awry, you definitely want to get out of that. Uh, No matter how good the numbers look, if there's something that's twisting your gut and it doesn't feel good in your heart and in your gut, you get out and we find another buyer. The other thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to poke their vulnerabilities. And I don't usually do this early on. We usually do it midway or toward the end. But if they are a little bit vulnerable, you're going to thoughtfully poke those vulnerabilities. And it's okay to do that. You know, it's okay to ask those hard questions. And if you have really hard questions, those questions are best asked by a third party. They're best asked by your business broker or your M&A guy, right? If you have something that you want to ask them and, and you don't want it coming directly from you, let your advisor be the bad guy. Let your M&A person be the bad guy. Your broker asks those questions. Coming from them instead of you, even though it's indirectly from you, is better. Why? Because it maintains and preserves your relationship between the buyer and the seller. So as you have these hard questions, give them to your advisor. Let them ask those questions in the meetings instead of you. You're going to ask thoughtful questions. You're going to ask questions about strategy. You're going to ask questions about big picture and the little methodical questions, the specific kind of poking about the number of questions, like where's the money coming from? This is a good question for a broker. Where's the money coming from and how is it going to work? Basically, do you qualify, right? How are you qualified to buy this business? Let your advisors ask those type of questions and you ask questions about strategy, about transition. So we set the cadence through the whole process. And it's okay to pause. We have this saying, and that is the power of the pause. And as they are asking you questions, it's okay to just stop and to think, even to the point where they're uncomfortable, where they're squirming a bit in their chair. That's perfectly fine for them to squirm a bit while you're thinking about it. But you want them to know that you're thinking about it. You don't want to fire off answers really quick, rapid fire type. You want to intentionally breathe and think and pause and then answer the questions because that pause is power. And that pause shows them that you're trying to think and that you're trying, that this is a big decision for you. So we set that cadence. We set the pauses and they are the ones that are pushing the gas through the whole process. Use the word thank you. We appreciate you looking at this and and show gratitude to them because they have money and time. And then you turn and say, we thank you. And instead of interested, never use the word interested, use the word intrigued. We are intrigued by you. We are intrigued at what you're offering. We're intrigued at what you have told us so far. Good thing to ask him, or or what are your plans for the company? Where do you see this going 5, 10, 15 years from now? How do you plan to grow and to scale? Have you done it before? Right? This is a job interview and they're interviewing for the, the job. Have you done this before? And how many times and how successful was it? I like to ask about their failures. When did it fail and how did it fail? Why did it fail? What were the reasons that it failed? Here's a very pointed question that your M&A advisor can ask, and that is, have you ever retraded on the price after the LOI? And if you did, what were the reasons for the retrade? Some of these people come in and and they offer a really good above market offer. And the way they approach it, they offer a really good above market offer, get the ring on the finger, they get you off the market. And then in due diligence, they start poking holes in everything and they retrade or they lower that price. You don't want to do that. You don't want to work with people that do that. And so you ask them, have you ever retraded on the price? Have you ever lowered the price after LOI? Have you ever raised the price after LOI? (laughs) That would be an interesting one. Very seldom do I see that, but have you ever retraded on the price or do you? And then listen to their response and watch their eyes and listen to their voice tones. Sometimes what they don't say or or sometimes the non 
verbal cues are more important than what they are saying. You want to gain some certainty about their ability to provide the money for the transaction. Are they using a bank? Are they private equity? If they're private equity, are they fully funded or do they have to go out and sell it? So basically you're selling this twice. So these are really good questions. Questions about their working capital target calculation. So as I've said before, the working capital definition and calculation changes with the party. And we want to understand that in these initial interviews. A good question to ask him is, what are their thoughts on timing? Their expectation of closing? How long does it typically take them from the time of LOI to close a transaction? And what are some things they would see that would make it be longer than that or shorter than that? Again, you're seeing these thoughtful, probing questions to gain understanding where they're coming from, to gain understanding of their experience level, how many times they've done this, who they've done it with. And if they've done acquisitions before, it's fair to ask for names and phone numbers of the people that they have have acquired so that you can call them and ask them, how are these guys to work with? You know, pre-closing and post-closing. And what does that transition look like? What did the first week look like after closing? These are fair questions. Transition after closing, what does the first 60 days look like? Are they going to go in and fire a bunch of employees? Are they going to go in and change pay structures? These are things that just are the death knell to a business. I mean, it just kills it. And you want to understand what they do, how they do it, what their plans are. And they may change their plans, but you're going to want to get in their head and their thinking. Um, Here's another good question. What do you expect from us as a management team or as business owners or owner. After it closes, what are your expectations, time expectations? If you're working through a training, they're going to expect you to train them and then leave, but maybe they want you to stay. And what does that look like? Does your vacation time change? Does your freedom and flexibility to come in and out of the office change? Because you're moving from business owner to employee, which is a big shift. So what are their expectations of you as a business owner and you moving forward after the closing. Here's a good question. Is there anything else that we should know about you? As we're considering these offers, what else would you like us to know about you? What would be important for us to know to help us with this decision? For example, and that question turns it where it's like they are the ones interviewing for the job and you are hiring them, right? It's a shift. So I love that question. If you have hard questions, ask the hard questions in the middle. You don't want to lead with hard questions. You want to lead with softball questions. You want to throw them a few easy ones and then ask the hard questions in the very middle or toward the end of the interview or toward the end of the meeting. You have to warm them up first. Don't just go in for the kill. You know, you've got to warm these people up and then you ask those questions, which are harder, which are maybe a little bit more probing. Never say simple or easy. Because if you say simple and easy, say, yeah, we built this business. It's so simple. It's so easy to do it. You say that too much, they're going to think that they can do it without you. Instead of saying simple and easy, say, you know what? This this model is complicated and what we do is complex, but we have streamlined systems and processes and we built out sales channels to minimize the amount of effort we have to put in and we have controls in place. We have processes and we have people here that do it. You don't want to say simple and easy. Just remove those from your vocabulary. Another fair question is what are your plans to scale? What do you estimate revenue is going to be after the first year, second year, third? You know, how are you going to scale this and help us understand what that looks like and what you're thinking the potential of this is with you at the helm? employees. So employees are a big one. And you can ask them, what are your plans with my employees? These people I've worked with, many of them are my friends. I mean, I feel like they're family. I want to know that they're taken care of. So help me understand how that's going to happen and what you've done in the past. want to make sure that this business, which is my baby, is going to be taken care of too. And I want to make sure we have a good fit, that I have a partner, that our cultures align our chemistry and our values. And I'll tell you, if your key values do not align with a buyer, do not let them buy your company. It will be a disaster, no matter how big the dollars are and you got stars in your eyes and Cinderella again, dancing with this handsome prince that looks like he's going to be a king. 
And if your gut's telling you different and your values don't align, don't go forward. Kindly let them know they're not the only game in town. You just slip up, say, as we're considering these offers instead of offer, right? Because we're considering the offers. We want to know these things in the plural. Kindly remind them and remind yourself that this is a win-win. If it's a not a win-win, then there's not a deal here. There's not a deal to be done. These transactions have to be win-win. And you're going to get the important things, but you're not going to get everything. You know, sometimes you may give up a C or a D item for an A or a B item, right? And so you're going to get the important things and your M&A advisor will help you with that. Your broker, your investment banker will help you make sure you get the main things, but you don't normally get everything. There's a little bit of a give and a take. Asking the questions is a two-way street. Sometimes sellers feel like when they go into a meeting that the buyers are asking the questions and they need to answer, but no, bring out your own list of questions probing thoughtful questions going into the meeting. Use the power of pause and you're going to make a good decision. You're going to pick the right buyer. You're going to pick the right prince that's going to be your king, right? (laughs) Take your time. Think about it a lot. Ask these good questions and you will have a very successful meeting and a very successful transaction. Thank you for joining us today. And hopefully this will help you as you're meeting with buyers and you're doing phone interviews and Zoom calls and due diligence with the buyers. Hopefully this will help you. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. M&A murders and accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to say these are good things that we're talking about today to help you. Thank you for attending our podcast. We invite you to join us for future episodes of M&A murders and accusations the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. You can also visit us at www.bsalesgroup.com or email Rick directly at rick at bsalesgroup.com.